All right, our final video in our module one lecture series is going to be covering the quality of research. And we're going to start by talking about something called internal validity. So internal validity is typically going to refer to the design of the study. Um, and it's the measure of control within the experiment. So within being internal that ensures results are due to the treatment applied. So the goal in research is to, most often than not, we want to maximize internal validity. And the way that we do that is paying attention and minimizing threats to internal validity. So we'll go through examples of each of these. Um, but threats to internal validity are oftentimes learning effects, intervening or extraneous variables, or instrument or investigator error. Okay, so again, the goal is to maximize internal validity or maximize um, the transfer of what we're doing inside of the experiment as it applies to the results we actually get. Learning or exposure effects um, are more often observed in pre and post test scenarios when multiple trials of an action are completed. So usually we can control for learning effects when we have the inclusion of a control group, right? So that we can differentiate how much, how much of the changes observed are due to the exposure of the treatment and then how much are actually due to learning or the exposure effect. So um, we could have a control group be the same as the experimental group. That would be an example of within subject design or we can have the control group be separate from um, the experimental group, which would be a between subject design. But the point of having a baseline measurement is to say, this is where people started, and then however much change we notice is likely due to the um, treatment. Now, things that we usually have to keep in mind, because um, even with a control group, you don't always have, or you can't always cancel out learning effects. Um, and an example would be a comparison of novice to experienced individuals. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to look at the changes observed in novice performers, usually, right, um, if you guys, I don't, hopefully you remember what the power law of practice is from KIN 312. Um, but typically, novice performers make very large errors and a higher quantity of errors than a more experienced individuals who make smaller errors and a lower quantity of errors, right? So the room for improvement is a lot larger for a novice performer than it is for an experienced individual. So if we give both novice and experienced performers the same intervention, we most likely are going to expect that novice performers will have a higher um, or a yeah a higher rate of improvement than the experienced people just because they have more errors to correct or further to go. Um, in that case, the differences then between novice and experienced individuals are partially due to learning or exposure effects. Okay, um, so typically we can remedy learning effects by giving practice trials, right? So then the practice trial, usually you'll see a boost in performance as the person gets used to the movement pattern. And then once they're kind of used to that, then you actually collect your data post practice trials. Another method commonly used is to analyze the middle trials. So let's say we collect five trials in total, we discount or discredit the first trial, we discredit the last trial, and we only are concerned with the middle three. Um, you can also use this uh, inclusion exclusion criteria based on a person's familiarity with movement, right? So if I am collecting a sample of people, I specifically want novice performers, or I specifically want people with X number of years of experience in performing this skill. That way I have a better understanding that everybody who's starting in the experiment is at relatively the same level. 
Another threat to internal validity is what we call intervening variables. These could also be called extraneous variables or confounding variables or confounders. Um, and these are variables that directly affect the results of the dependent variable that is measured, but they're not actually accounted for in the study. Usually these are going to be controlled with your inclusion and exclusion criteria when you're collecting your sample, um, but they can also be things that need to be considered in the actual design of your study. Um, but they should be controlled for that way you're not adding in different variables that are impacting the measurements you're collecting. Okay, so I have several examples on this slide, MVIC testing. MVIC stands for uh, Maximal Voluntary Isometric Contraction. When we do um, electromyography, that's what EMG stands for, where we measure muscle activity, typically we take a maximal voluntary effort contraction um, in a certain position. So if we're in the quads, we do a leg extension, we tell somebody to kick as hard as they can against some type of resistance, and then the activity we get from there serves as a normalizer so that we can say, oh, someone's working at 60% of their maximum contraction. Okay, If we were collecting maximal effort contractions, we would not want somebody to come in after doing a leg day at the gym, right? So in terms of... Um, variables in our study design, we would make sure somebody has no exercise for the past, you know, 24 to 48 hours, or that they haven't specifically exercised the muscle group we're testing for 24 to 48, 48 hours to make sure that they have a sufficient recovery time. Okay, so in that respect, um, somebody going to the gym or doing a leg day or exhausting themselves, fatigue, right, would be a confounding variable for this MVIC measurement that we might want to collect. Sometimes confounding variables might be a post-test given too soon after a treatment. So um, especially if fatigue is a factor or if you're in a clinical setting and you're doing medication or drug trials or a surgery, right? If someone comes right out of surgery, you're not going to be like, all right, what's your movement like? Because they're going to be somewhat restricted. Um, that way they don't open up their stitches and bleed everywhere. But sometimes you have to give your experiment time or a certain amount of time to actually like show an effect. So in that case, time would be a confounding variable and oftentimes in, in more clinical settings we'll do like here's a baseline, we do the um, medical treatment and then we have all right well what is their progress at one month what's their progress at three months what's their progress at six months that type of thing another example would be having healthy participants with no previous injuries so this is a very common one that I use um, in in study designs for my uh, inclusion exclusion criteria for my subjects um, Typically, we say like healthy, meaning you don't have risk of heart attack or um, you don't have any underlying health conditions that are going to impact the movements or skills that you're performing. Same would go with, with injuries. Sometimes we say we have to specify like, oh, no lower extremity injuries within the last three months or um, if you do have a current injury, it should not impact um, how you perform whatever movement we're studying, okay? But if somebody has an injury, like compensatory mechanisms are a very common thing to avoid re-injury or to avoid pain. So typically we say if we have healthy participants with no previous injuries plus some criteria, that makes sure that everybody's starting out on the same uh, level or that they're not being impeded by their health or like underlying health conditions or current injuries. Um, if we looked at the comparison of diet's effectiveness on weight loss, a confounding variable in that type of example would be how much exercise is a person doing outside of the diet, right? So usually if we want to look at diet effectiveness, maybe we collect people with a certain BMI, okay? So if we specifically wanted to look at diet on obese people, we would collect people BMIs of 30 or higher. Um, 
with weight loss specifically, like people who are closer to their ideal body weight, it's a lot harder to lose weight than if you had someone who was further away from their ideal body weight. So in that case, BMI would be a confounding variable that we would want to nitpick in our inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, Exercise or the amount of exercise someone does, maybe we uh, tighten our study down to just sedentary individuals or we tighten it down to people who do less than an hour of exercise or movement a week for a significant movement, thus where your heart rate like gets elevated past a certain point. Um, so those would both be examples of confounding variables in that type of scenario. Another type of threat to internal validity is instrument or error bias instrument error or bias. Um, so this is error due to faulty instrumentation or equipment and usually is controlled with continual calibration of the equipment. Um, <clears throat> the best example I can come up with is measurements of force or if you're taking a person's weight on a scale. Usually there's a tear function or a zero function where you zero out the force plate or you zero out the scale and then you take your measurement. Um, 3D motion capture calibrates a uh, three-dimensional space based on a set origin. Okay, so if you guys remember, well, actually I don't know if you still do this lab in 300, but typically you had to have some type of calibration tool if you were doing a two-dimensional uh, video recording so that you were able to tell what the dimensions of your space are, right? And it typically was like you have some type of object that has a defined length and then you insert that length into whatever programming you're using so that way you know in this recorded space from here point point A to point B is this distance and this object was this far away from the camera. Okay. Range of motion testing with an inclinometer. I don't know if any of you guys have ever used a bubble inclinometer but it's like a little circle tool and then there's liquid inside and then there's a dial that you can turn that has degree measurements on it. Um, but sometimes when we're doing tests where we're looking at if someone's below a horizontal reference, um, we put the little bubble inclinometer on the moving part of their limb. And then when it tilts, what happens is the, the liquid moves. So if we don't zero out that inclinometer, that would be um, introducing instrument error or bias. The last type of threat to internal validity is um, investigator error or bias. So this is when the investigator um, either intentionally or unintentionally uh, misreports data. So this could be due to errors in reading measurements. So let's say taking someone's height and we write down the wrong number or we switch our numbers around. It could include tester to tester reliability. So if I was doing a 3D marker set on somebody, had one person put markers on and then another person put markers on, if they don't um, palpate the body in the same way and like if let's say we had them put markers on the same person and there was some degree of difference in where that marker was actually placed, that would be an example of investigator error related to tester 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 to tester reliability. Um, other type of investigator error could be bias when you're judging skills. Okay, so when you're using a personal evaluation instead of a standardized criteria or test. Another example could be lack of a uh, experiment experience using the equipment. So if you just haven't, you know, done something for very long, sometimes you read things wrong, you don't calibrate correctly, that would be investigator bias. The hopefully not doesn't happen would be intentional falsification of data. So this would either be adjusting data values to um, prove or disprove a hypothesis or using different methods for different subjects, um, which also not great. Um, so typically when you write out your methodology, you send it into an in, uh, internal review board or the IRB, and then they evaluate what your methods are, say this is ethical, this is not ethical, if it's not ethical you make some changes, and then the methods that have been approved by that review board are the ones that you use for every single person.
also the methods that you outline on how you analyze your data. You analyze your data in the exact same way for every single person. Okay. So again, internal validity is looking at the characteristics or the soundness of um, inside the study design. External validity, um, also referred to as environmental validity, is going to refer to the generalizability of the results. And we have an entire lecture just based on this concept of statistical inference. But what you're trying to do is say, this sample that I've collected from the subset of a population, I do some measurements on them, I analyze the data, and then the results I get from that sample are representative of what I would expect to see in the population of interest. Okay, so different ways that we can um, maximize external validity is by not doing lab research, which, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, labs are great because we have controlled environments, therefore reducing the number of confounding variables, thus increasing internal validity, but the lab space is not always exactly the same as the real world space that we would actually observe whatever we're measuring in. So um, lab research is one way that we can maximize internal validity by eliminating confounding variables, but it decreases external validity um, because then it's not generalizable to the real world. So using more real life spaces would be a good way to improve external validity. Uh, sample characteristics are another thing that contribute to external validity. Um, it's good to be specific in your inclusion and exclusion criteria, but if you're too specific, then your characteristics limit how generalizable your um, results are to the, the rest of the population. So either you could have non-random sampling, which if you have a non-random sample, it won't fit the shape of a bell curve, which is typically what we assume a population or a, a what's the word? It's a, a sample, it's a distribution of sample means, basically, um, which, again, we get to when we talk about statistical inference. But if your sample is not random, it doesn't have the same shape that we would expect to see from the population. Or it just could be too limited. So maybe we say I want to, or let's say I end up sampling females from the ages of 18 to 30 but I'm trying to generalize my results to females of all ages. In that respect, the people that I collected were too limiting for the results that I actually wanted to present. So really what I can present based on the sample I've collected is on females from ages 18 to 30. Intervening variables or confounding variables can also play a role in um, how much external validity we have. Uh, the way that we apply in intervening variables or different examples is very similar to uh, the relationship with internal validity. Um, so it's like lab research, right? The more that we control for confounding variables, um, the more that we know the results of our study are due to the experiment, but also we know that if we treated a sample in this way and we've eliminated confounding variables that are not present in like the population, then our results are generalizable from sample to population. Okay, the last part of this lecture that I wanted to talk about is the misuse of statistics. So this is inaccurate or misleading reporting of results. Oftentimes this could be due to small or non-random samples. Okay, so the sample should be a good chunk of people or a a good size of people. If we only had three people and we said the average weight lifted is this number, right? It, all right, well, you could have one person who can't lift anything, like SpongeBob and his um, like stuffed animals, versus like Larry, the lobster who can lift however many pounds, and then maybe you have like Sandy in the middle, right? Um, and so when you have varying degree or like kind of very big ranges 
of values that can be assumed by the measurement you're taking, a small sample size is going to screw up the mathematical calculations you could do, specifically averages. Um, so small samples, non-random samples, if you don't have adequate operational definitions or they're not specific enough. Um, the example I like to use with this one is uh, like, Frozen is the number one movie in theaters. Well, is it the number one movie in animated films in theaters? Because if it's the only animated film in theaters, then yeah, it's going to be the number one, right? So if you don't adequately define your variables, then that kind of leaves room for interpretation or overinflation of your results. Presence of outliers. This is semi-related to having small and non-random samples because usually you'll end up with outliers or types of extreme scores in um, non-random or small distributions. Um, generally speaking, it's the responsibility of the researcher to report well-documented, valid, reliable, and objective results. So this not only includes the data they've collected and analyzed, but it also includes the data and information that they report from other sources. So when you do your literature review and you say, oh, my data compared to these people's data in this way, the way that you report other people's results is important. If not, then you've misused your statistical um, analyses, you've misused statistical inference, and your conclusions are not necessarily valid anymore. However, the reader also has to take some accountability in how they interpret the results. So whether somebody has accurately reported their results or not, it's up to you guys to, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. So um, you always need to maintain some degree of skepticism. Um, and I actually have a class every single semester where we you know, get a research article every week, we read it, and then we critique it, and we say, well, this is something they could have done better, or I wonder why they reported this result when they left out some bit of information that was critical to actually understanding the interpretation. Okay, so it's not just on the researcher to report everything, but it's also on you to um, take what you will from the research that is presented. Okay. So that's our spiel on the quality of research and um, how we use it. That concludes our module lectures for this week. So you do have an activity that's based in Excel, which will take some time, so please don't save it till the last minute. Um, and then you also um, will have like a quiz component that comes from the practice videos that you watch. Some of the stuff that we're doing within that activity does relate back to the lecture. Um, some of this internal validity, external validity stuff we won't, you know, bring up until uh, later modules, but review it, take your notes. If you have questions, let me know.